Ladies and gentlemen, my name's Paul, and in the ShredGamingTech.com video, we're going to be discussing and analysing tech news, which as usual has popped up in the past 24 or so hours. I hope you're all having an amazing day. We have an awful lot of news to get through in this video, and unusually, I'm going to start things out with Microsoft. Typically, I prefer to uh, handle news alphabetically, but this is the exception to the rule, because I really want to discuss with you some changes to DirectX 12. So DX12, of course, is now several years old, and there was a ridiculous amount of excitement when DX12 was announced by Microsoft. DX11 was starting to creak, quite frankly, and while Microsoft did do their best to improve multi-threaded performance with DX11, its best just wasn't really enough. It just it was not designed with high-core count CPUs in mind. Let's just put it that way. And AMD kickstarted this thanks to Mantle, which was an API that they created for their own GCN-based uh, architectures, their own GPUs, in other words. And Mantle was a low-level API, but was designed squarely around their own GPUs. I actually interviewed Robert Halleck, I believe, back in the day regarding Mantle and what uh, AMD were trying to achieve with it. But the good news was that while Mantle fell by the wayside, it gave birth to two children, and they are named DirectX 12 and Vulcan. DX12, of course, is um, being uh, cared for by Microsoft, where Vulcan is uh, created by the Kronos Group. And I've also had interviews with uh, several folks over at the Kronos Group as well, if you want to go ahead and check that out. DirectX 12 had numerous improvements, including the fact that, yes, it could uh, be much more efficient when it came to uh, the utilisation of multiple CPU cores. It was also much lighter weight as well, so it had a far lower uh, overhead. There were some drawbacks, particularly when it came to multi-GPU setups. Developers needed to do much more work to implement, let's say, Crossfire or SLI. But overall, I think it was a very big uh, positive for PC gaming. But the reason I'm bringing this up is because DX12 has received yet another update. So, it wasn't too long ago, back in 2018, that we saw the inclusion of Direct uh, of DirectX Ray Tracing, DXR, and that was 1.0. Well, Microsoft have now updated this to Tier 1.1 and also made several other enhancements as well. So, the improvements to the October 2018 release... Uh, for ray tracing, I'll get into the other stuff in just a moment, is support for adding extra shaders to an existing ray tracing PSO, which greatly increases the efficiency for dynamic PSO additions, support for executing direct for ray tracing, which enables adaptive algorithms where the number of rays is decided on the GPU execution pipeline, and introduce inline ray tracing, which provides more direct control of ray traversal algorithms and shader scheduling. A less complex alternative when the full shader based ray tracing system is overkill. And more flexibility since ray query can now be called at every shader stage and this also opens new DXR ray tracing, especially in compute. I find these parts particularly interesting because we can now use ray tracing for culling, physics, occlusion, queries, and so on. And DX, uh, DXR Tier 1.1 is a superset of Tier 1, so developers should build their ray tracing solutions on existing Tier 1 APIs and then upgrade them to Tier 1.1. So that is an awful lot of information, and to be honest with you, if I, du if I dive super deeply into this, this video would be super, super, super long. Execute Indirect is not a new technology for, direct, for DirectX 12, it was actually used for standard rasterization stuff first, but has obviously now been uh, adapted, haha, for ray tracing. I also went quite in depth into what Execute Indirect is in the past, so if you literally search Execute Indirect on the channel, or also go to the website and do much the same, several topics will pop up with this. But as a quick reminder, Execute Indirect essentially enables culling 
and also scene traversals, that type of stuff, to be moved from the CPU to the GPU, which can definitely improve performance depending on the hardware. Furthermore, the command buffer itself, obviously that uh, command buffer is, well, a quite an important step <laughs> when drawing a scene, can also be generated on now either the CPU or also the GPU itself. So while they don't really go into the super nitty gritty of what they're doing with uh, executing direct for ray tracing, it seems like essentially while a scene is being drawn based upon the workload on the GPU and also probably several other characteristics which I'm assuming as a developer you can choose from probably based upon quality settings, frame rates, specific targets, so on and so on the GPU can make a decision of how many rays that actually need to be cast into a scene because it can quickly start to become, let's say, taxing on a GPU. When Microsoft and NVIDIA and the other companies release more information on this, I will go into a deeper dive on some of this stuff. But another thing I really wanted to discuss was mesh shader for DirectX. Uh, for DirectX. So mesh shaders are actually something we've seen with Turing. Uh, yeah, that's right. NVIDIA were using mesh shaders even back in the day when Turing first launched. Indeed, there was actually a demo of it created that you can actually download. It's called Asteroids. Uh, so mesh shaders are actually a really cool technology. With Asteroids demo, uh, the Asteroids themselves could be comprised of several levels of detail. So you could have asteroids which were made up of like 6 million triangles or as few as 20 triangles. And obviously each of these is a different level of detail. So depending on the distance that you are from the asteroid object, depending on what's blocking the asteroid and you know numerous other criteria, the Asteroid will be essentially drawn in different levels of detail, which can drastically improve the performance. So this means that the GPU can actually uh, have the number of triangles it needs to draw uh, decreased by a massive quantity. And this is a combination of different techniques, including the um, mesh shader itself, plus other GPU culling techniques. There's also another feature that I find rather interesting in the wake of what we know about the next generation consoles, but it's also highly applicable to the PC as well. So of course, when you render games with higher texture quality settings and also higher resolutions, well, it just takes up a lot of memory. Those textures take up an awful lot of VRAM and also increase the time it takes to load the game itself. So. There are ways around that, of course. You could simply um, have crappier looking assets. That's certainly one way to do it. So what happens here is that a scene is rendered, but let's say that several textures are not at the quality that the game engine feels is applicable. So, for example, you've come close enough where the level of detail now needs to be higher because otherwise they're going to look blurry. Well... The best option then, at least with this uh, workflow, is that the scene is rendered, but the texture will then start to be loaded from the SSD, and then the new textures will then be mapped onto the older texture tiles. There are also numerous other enhancements to DirectX 12 plus DXR, and it's going to be very interesting to see how this uh, improves performance over the next couple of years, particularly given the next generation of consoles, of course, are going to have access to super fast storage devices, which is something that they currently don't have with the Xbox One X, for example, or the PS4 Pro. And furthermore, it's going to be very interesting to see what improvements in ray tracing performance are we going to see with even Turing. Are we going to see drastic performance gains with games that, for example, receive a patch? I would be very interested to see what happens, for example, on a patched version of, let's say, Control, and to see what type of enhancements in terms of frame rates we could get versus also the quality loss. And now on to some AMD news. This one concerns TRX40 motherboards, as Gigabyte have done an oopsie. 
and have accidentally confirmed four different motherboards are on the way. From Gigabyte, we now have the TRX40 Aurorus Extreme TRX40, the Aurorus Master TRX40, the Pro Wi-Fi, and finally the TRX40 Designaire. This was actually first discovered by Momomo on Twitter, but unfortunately we still don't know the compatibility side of the Frid Ripper third generation equation. The current consensus is that there will not be backwards slash forwards compatibility with the older motherboards slash processors. So to put things in an easy way, uh, basically if you have a second generation X399 board, then you won't be able to plonk in the third generation CPUs, and also vice versa is uh, also true. There's also something I'd really like to bring your attention to regarding AMD's latest financial report, and that is that the company have actually increased the amount of cash it's spending in research and development. I think it's fair to say that AMD have not exactly had a huge R&D budget compared to NVIDIA or Intel and so on and so on. So while they're basically scrimping and saving uh, pennies to conduct their research, they've done a ridiculously good job. However, according to AMD's CFO, operating expenses grew 13% year over year, primarily driven by an increase in R&D investments and support for our new product introductions. Then Lisa Su added, we did spend a little more this year than we originally planned, and that was frankly because of opportunities are very strong. And most of the additional spend is targeted at R&D with the notion of platform investments, software investments to ensure that we capture the opportunities that we have. And finally, I want to discuss with you Intel's server roadmap, because we now have a much more in-depth understanding of what Intel will be doing for its servers in 2020, thanks to an image that was uh, taken by Brian Box of a, quote, CPU comparison of the Intel dual processor platform. Uh, so there are going to be two distinct types of CPUs that Intel launch next year. In the second quarter of 2020, we will see Cooper Lake, which of course is still based on, based, excuse me, on the Skylake architecture, whereas Ice Lake launches the quarter after that, that's the third quarter of 2020, and it will be using the Sunny Cove architecture, which has around an 18% IPC gain over uh, Skylake. And that will also be using the 10NM Plus node. Uh, I'll get into the enhancements of 10NM Plus over regular plain old 10M in just a moment. But uh, both of these will be using the Socket P Plus, and there is a difference in TDP, so... It's 300 watts for Cooper Lake, which is on the Skylake architecture, and Ice Lake will be 270 watts. Both of those are up to two sockets, with 38 cores per socket for Ice Lake, and we will also see support for eight memory channels uh, for up to 3200 MHz, 16 DIMMs per socket, and also support for second-gen Intel persistent memory. The other difference as well comes down to PCIe lanes. Of course, Skylake supports only Gen 3, although 64 lanes over the Cascade Lake and it's only 48 lanes. Whereas Ice Lake bumps this up a notch, up to 64 lanes, yes, the same, but it's Gen 4 over Gen 3. So 10NM Plus, I'm sure, is going to be the next meme that people are going to be using on the internet. But there are definitely enhancements over 14NM, it's apparently 2.7 times the density scaling versus 14nm. Self-aligned quad patterning, contact over active gates, first gen Foveros 3D stacking, and also second generation EMIB. Both of those are going to be rather important technologies over the next couple of years from Intel to combat its competitors, particularly AMD. Apologies for not being on camera for this video. Normally, I know it's Amy that's not on camera, and I normally am. However, uh, I wasn't originally intending to do the news today because I'm in the process of finishing off a couple of reviews and also a couple of projects. 
But uh, Amy is struck down with the plague. She's caught the flu after going to a Comic-Con convention with her boyfriend over the weekend. So, yeah. uh, I didn't think that it would make much sense for her to be coughing and spluttering for most of the video. With all of that said, take care of yourselves, and bye for now.